Hello. Welcome to the Thinkers 50 Radar 2023 series, brought to you in partnership with Deloitte. I'm Des Dearlove. And I'm Stuart Craner, and we are the founders of Thinkers 50. For more than 20 years, Thinkers 50 has been identifying, ranking and sharing extraordinary business and management ideas. Every January, we announce 30 management and business thinkers to watch in the coming year. These are the new and exciting voices of management. The result for 2023 is an eclectic group of people who we believe will make an impact with their ideas, their campaigning, their research and their passion in the coming 12 months. More than that, by showcasing their ideas, we hope they will be inspired to carry the torch for management thinking in the years ahead. Now, they, they don't have all the answers, uh, but they are asking important questions. And talking of questions, we welcome yours at any time during this session. Please let us know where you are joining from today and send over your thoughts, questions, insights, complaints at any time during the session. Uh, today, we are delighted to be joined by one of those new and exciting voices, Brian Wong. Brian was the first American and only the 52nd employee to join the Alibaba Group, where he contributed to the company's early globalization efforts and served as Jack Ma's Special Assistant for International Affairs. During his 16-year tenure, he established the Alibaba Global Initiatives, AGI division, and was the founder and executive director of the Alibaba Global Leadership Academy. Brian is the author of The Tower of Alibaba, Inside the Chinese Digital Giant That Is Changing the World, remains an advisor to the AGI team, and regularly teaches courses on China's digital economy and the Tower of Alibaba management principles. Brian also founded Radii.co, uh, a digital media platform dedicated to bridging understanding between East and West. Brian, welcome. Thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Des and Stuart, for having me. So how did you get here? You've got an MBA from Wharton, and yet you were the only the 52nd employee and first American to join, join Alibaba. How, how did that come about? Well, I, I would say, um, uh, Stuart, my, my, my path was a bit non-traditional. Um, in fact, the MBA was sort of the afterthought um, because I was originally... Um, planning to go into a healthcare type of uh, profession. My dream was to work for Médecins Sans Frontières and be a doctor at the front lines of uh, crisis or, or war zones. And um, somehow I got off the track. I went to China more out of personal interest, studied grad school to learn about the culture um, with, with an interest in the health policy uh, environment there. Uh, that was my thesis at the time when I studied at the grad program. Um, but somehow I ended up staying and working in management consulting. I went back to the States and tried public service and government. And then I met Jack Ma. Uh, and what he was trying to do sounded really appealing, mixing technology and development work. Uh, and I felt that I needed to get some real business credentials. So I went and got my MBA after uh, realizing that I might pursue something more related to business. So how, how did you meet Jack Ma? Well, Jack was introduced to a, a, a mutual friend, um, and uh, this friend uh, happened to uh, stumble upon uh, the company as well and decided to invest um, in uh, Alibaba and actually join the company. And so, uh, you know, Jack was trying to hire an international team, and, and this individual uh, decided to get on board and help Jack uh, to build that. He's actually the co-founder. Um, and so, so yeah, it was, it was through a mutual friend. And... Um, uh, introduced to me in San Francisco when I was working there. So we're going to talk a bit, obviously we're going to talk about the book in a minute, but I'm, I'm just curious to know what, what stage of development was the company in when you joined? I mean, if you were the 52nd person to come on board, what, you know, what, what did it look like? What did it feel like? What was it like? Well, I mean, it was still very much in the inception stage. It was in Jack's apartment. Um, they had set up a small office also in Hong Kong, but um, I ended up, going straight to Hangzhou um, because they needed international people to help out. And, you know, there was a great sense of optimism and um, hope. Uh, I think we, we just kind of felt we were throwing ourselves into something. And it, and it felt very much like a family because actually a lot of the, the early employees were Jack's former students. He was an English teacher and uh, they decided to join Jack because they were inspired by his vision. And some of them were actually his um, former business partners and colleagues, because he, many people don't realize this, he had actually started two companies. 
uh, prior to uh, Alibaba. And so uh, it was it was a very close group of people. And when I came in uh, as an American, um, I think people were very welcoming. But also there was this hope and, uh, you know, this this belief that, hey, maybe we could do something globally, not just in China. So did it feel um, did it feel like like a like a U.S. startup? Was it the same vibe or is it different? I mean, obviously, you knew Silicon Valley, you know, Silicon Valley. Did it feel the same or is it is, it, is a Chinese version different? Well, OK, so, you know, I grew up in Palo Alto and we, we sort of a lot of friends, um, their parents had like, you know, their garages were makeshift workshops. Some of them even started businesses. They were entrepreneurs. So I did have a flavor for what that felt like. And obviously a lot of friends were working at startups. And I went to China expecting quite the same. I mean, there were there was a ping pong table, I think, uh, or two. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there were plenty of computers. And I, I think the spirit of, of, of um, idealism and, and, and kind of the aspirations were the same. But there were also a lot of things that were different. And probably the most um, noticeable was just how um, just how, how nascent the market was. I mean, I talk about this in the book, but there were 8.8 .8 million Internet users at the time. Uh, the per capita income was 800 U.S. dollars. And frankly, the market was didn't seem ready at all for something like the internet. And I went in there kind of naive thinking, oh, we could go and just do what we did do, do in Silicon Valley. But there was a lot of work that had to be done prior to that, which I think for me was very uh, eye-opening, but also very frustrating. As people joining us from Switzerland, Poland, Hong Kong, Morocco, Turkey, the UK, and elsewhere in the world, please send over your questions for Brian at any time. Brian, what about the personality of Jack Ma? I mean, he must be a hugely persuasive salesman for his his English literature students to follow him into business. And how, how did, what what vision did he sell to you? Because as you say, these were very nascent times. Yeah, well, you know, so I think Jack's superpower is his per power of persuasion, and it wasn't just his students um, that he was able to kind of uh, mobilize. I, and, and you know, by the way, he he always talks about failing, you know, his college entrance exam twice and as maybe a reflection of his academic uh, prowess, but he was extremely, extremely inspirational. And he always got the top teaching awards at the institutions that he was, uh, you know, an instructor or a teacher. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, when I met him, um, that aura or that, 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 that sort of personality uh, was certainly there, but also what he was saying made a lot of sense. Um, you know, I, as a management consultant, my job mainly was helping multinationals with their market entry strategies. And one of the biggest challenges they had was information asymmetry. They didn't know which companies to um, to contact. They didn't know, uh, you know, who was trustworthy. They didn't know what, um, you know, where they were, what they produced. And what Jack was talking about, this concept of Alibaba back then, it was this B2B marketplace, was just a no-brainer in that you use the internet in order to connect buyers and sellers globally in to reduce some of that friction. Um, and so he laid that out, but he also had this sort of level of enthusiasm and confidence that I think I hadn't seen in, in many other people uh, in the space. And also he was really at the forefront of this. Um, I don't think most people were basically copying models that were, you know, like the Yahoo portal or, or these sorts of things, but nobody was sort of focusing on these small, medium-sized enterprises because that even in the US was a, a loss-making endeavor because you're trying to aggregate small businesses that don't have big budgets to spend money on. So, um, uh, you know, I think Jack, he had a clear vision, but he also had that sort of um, that energy about him that that really made me feel like this guy knows what he's doing. OK, fantastic. Let's, yeah. let's um, we, I'm sure we will end up talking more about him and about the company. But let's talk a little bit about the book. What was the genesis of the book? How did how did it come about? Why did you write it? Because I think we were talking just before we came on air, how different it is when people take the time to actually reflect and codify their experiences of, yeah, of a yeah. management philosophy in a management system. And that really does take it to another level because it, it you, you have to really do the do the thinking as well as sort of put experiences into perspective. So tell us a little bit about how the book came about. Sure. Um, well, so, you know, when I first got to Alibaba the first few years, Whenever I'd come back to the Bay Area, I'd, I'd be so enthusiastic to share what was happening there because I felt like it was sort of an adventure, um, you know, being on the front lines and seeing what's happening in this emerging market, but also seeing how technology is evolving there. 
Um, and I think people were somewhat interested, but it, it just seemed like the backwater area and, and, and no one really thought it would develop as quickly as it did, that being China. But, you know, over the last 20 years that I was in and out of the company, um, I felt there was increasingly a disconnect in terms of um, what people were understanding in America about China and what was actually happening on the ground. And in some ways, I felt it was my responsibility to actually take the experience I had at Alibaba and share that in a way that was useful to my friends in Silicon Valley or in the U.S. And one of the things I noticed, for example, is, you know, um, students from uh, China that go to America, there's over 300,000, you know, uh, students that are in colleges and graduate schools, but Americans going to China, it's about 30,000. And that to me also was a clear, uh, you know, sort of imbalance in terms of the numbers of people who are really taking the time to understand this market um, and what's happening. And frankly, I think one of the biggest uh, motivations for me was feeling like there's so much innovation happening here in the consumer and e-commerce internet space um, that if we don't in America take the time to study it and learn it, we might actually end up be at a disadvantage. And um, uh, so I felt like, you know, the thing that at least I could do was try and share that, the learnings, the experience, and help bring this kind of to people's minds so that, you know, when we're thinking about global um, develop, you know, development, uh, how technology impacts not just uh, markets in, close to us in America, but also overseas, you know, what, what are the trends happening, but also what are we up against? And um, how how should we learn from these other examples? Do, do you think Western minds are are opening to learn learning about Chinese management and Chinese organizations? I mean, the, the numbers, as you say, are don't suggest they are. You know, I think there. Unfortunately, there's still a perception that um, maybe there isn't as much to learn as as they they, they realize. Um, but I think the results actually say a lot in terms of the size of these companies and their impact and. Frankly, what they've achieved, um, companies like Alibaba have achieved from starting li literally with zero and then creating an entire digital economy. Um, I think there is an appreciation now, but it's coming uh, out more as fear as opposed to curiosity. And um, it would have been nice if we kind of developed this interest in a more gradual sense, as opposed to through congressional hearings that are talking about the imminent threat of you know, a rising economy. Um, so, you know, hopefully this book can also help mitigate some of those fears and say, OK, before we just cast too, too you know, uh, broad a, a, just a judgment on this um, market and, and what's happening in this country, let's try and nuance this and see, you know, what, what are the learnings we can take from some of the great uh, companies that have emerged. We, as you know, at Thinkers 50, um, we, we partner with Hire, the Chinese um, white goods company, um, which mm. is fascinating and possibly a unique organization just because of the, its management philosophy and we can make that we can talk about the comparisons and it'll be interesting to hear your your views on that but for for the for the more curious rather than the more fearful people listening hopefully that that's most of the people <laughs> listening to this particular broadcast but what are the big i mean i know it's, it's asking a lot to, to you know and to, to ask you to sort of put it into a sound bite. But what are the big yeah. takeaways from the book? You know, what, what do you want managers outside China to get from it? You know, what, at least in terms of the, you know, some of the messages. Sure. So um, I'm glad you asked. I mean, there's a few key points here. The first um, is that the power of mission, vision, and um, values um, uh, remain a key driver of success uh, in, in the company, just like many international um, organizations. And um, this is something that I really emphasize and talk about in the book as, as a key to uh, Alibaba's long-term success. Um, and uh, the second point I would say is the testament of the power of technology to achieve scalable, positive impact on society. And uh, we talk about that, you know, I'm sure in the West quite a bit, but if you're starting with a society that had literally a rudimentary retail um, sort of ecosystem, very little in the way of uh, payments. I mean, credit card penetration was minuscule uh, when Alipay was started, but now digital payments, um, you know, are are multiples, um, tens of multiples times the size of the U.S. today. Uh, this is really the impact that um, technology can have on emerging markets. Um, the third point is really uh, how business can be used as a force of good. I think we talk a lot about today of ESGs and SDGs and and the importance of these. But here's a company that started out from, from its inception 
uh, with these values in ingrained in it to do good for society, to help um, bring, uh, you know, help the little guy, so to speak, um, have a chance uh, at becoming part of the mainstream economy. So business for good, I think uh, this, this Alibaba case makes a compelling argument. And then finally, I think the book was intended to um, provide a cultural learning, um, sort of a window into cultural learning of, you know, how Chinese philosophy impacts, um, uh, you know, co company uh, management principles and leadership principles. Uh, and that's why I integrate this concept of the Tao, which, you know, we can talk about more, but um, I wanted this to provide a window into how Chinese thinking has evolved um, relative to kind of business practices uh, and, because sometimes it's very difficult to take a philosophical concept and just um, talk about it in a vacuum. So it's interesting. There's a new book out called uh, Philosophy Inc. by Santiago, okay. Santiago Inues from IE Business School in, in in Spain and talks about the relevance of philosophy. And there's quite a lot at the moment in in Western management literature about the how philosophy can be useful in 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 a business business sphere. Hmm. But in, in China is kind of philosophy is is part of life in a way that yes. it isn't in the Western world. It's like kind of broadly understood and kind of uh, in, in, in intuitive and, and universal. Yes, that's right. So sometimes it's hard to separate the two out in terms of, you know, the philosophy and kind of your everyday thinking and your everyday work. So, I mean, in a very basic way, I attempt to do that in the book as well. Um, and, you know, I use my own personal experience as sort of the, the case study uh, because the philosophy is, is everything from personal to company, to society, to like universe, you know, it's, it, it, it addresses so many layers of our existence and you could get kind of caught in the weeds, but I just use my own personal journey as part of that, um, you know, talking points. Does that mean then that, that what we understand as you know, I mean, obviously words like purpose and meaning have become, you know, kind of common currency now. I mean, they were yeah. Um, you know, we can certainly remember when, you know, go, you go back 10 or 15 years and really that these, these weren't, you know, it was all shareholder value and we, we weren't talking about some of these things. But do they mean something different in the Chinese context? Do they, do they mean something different within Chinese society or are they are they just sort of universals? Well, I mean, I would say that from a company perspective, they might represent the same. And in, in you know, the book, I talk about this uh, dichotomy. Um, Alibaba, often Jack would describe it, is governed by Chinese philosophical beliefs and uh, Western management systems and processes, right? So you kind of got two sides of the brain operating. And if, if we take the word purpose, you can say from a business perspective, it's still very consistent with what we think about kind of in the Western construct. But if you apply the sort of Chinese philosophical interpretation, particularly around Tao or Taoism, then it's really the natural path by which you, you're, you're, you're going to evolve or your company is going to evolve. And so you can think about, you know, Jack having a purpose in creating the company which is to help the little guy, help small businesses. But at the same time, there was this whole sort of uh, confluence of factors that were happening in the world that really enabled this business to become what it is today, whether it's you know government policies, whether it's economic um, sort of trends, whether it's the WTO accession, um, whether it's globalization. So those things you don't control, uh, but they also define your path. And um, so that's where kind of the East and West management principles come together and when you look at this in reflection you say oh my gosh okay while you know jack was very charismatic and said x y and z and it sounded great there were also a lot of other factors that came into play that we have to take into account because one of the things that people often ask me is you know can how do i create another alibaba or could alibaba have been created you know today in today's world and you have to kind of walk them through this is what i do in chapter two all the um outside sort of considerations or external factors that were, you know, part of this phenomenon called Alibaba. Yeah, Frank uh, Kahlberg, who's watching, has got, got a couple of points. He, he points out that Hire, who uh, Des alluded to, is split up into a fa several thousand micro enterprises. Mm -hmm. is, is that something Alibaba learned from or does, does, does Hire's approach, is that mirrored in some way at Alibaba? 
Yeah, Frank, thanks that, for that comment. I mean, this is quite timely too, because uh, there was just news about um, splitting up the company into six parts. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that had a very positive response in the stock market. But this isn't the first time that this kind of restructuring has happened. Uh, in the book, I talk about how from 2011 to 2013, there was this rethink about uh, the company had become, you know, uh, quite, um, I guess, consolidated and bureaucratic. It had three main business units and then they split it into seven. And then in 2013, they split it into 25 smaller units. Uh, and the reason for that or the rationale was quite similar uh, to what we have today uh, that, you know, decision making and efficiency. And um, there are a lot of things that um, were getting sort of caught up in this, this bureaucratic system, particularly when the competition starts to intensify around certain aspects of the business. You don't have the visibility or transparency or nimbleness to make decisions on the fly. And so they broke up the company at that time into 25 parts and um, allowed each one to kind of grow at their at their own pace. Um, and so, you know, was it was it inspired by hire? I'm not sure um, because I'm not sure when the dates, you know, when that happened. But I, I do think that there was recognition of the need to um, evolve the business. And, and the thing is, this is very cyclical. So it, you know, it starts out um, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it, it might grow to a certain size and then it breaks up and then uh, grows again. Certain businesses die out, certain some businesses continue to develop and then it consolidates and then it breaks up again. This has probably happened at least twice or three times in the company's history. Yeah. yeah, it's that, it's that appetite for self renewal, though. That's, that's yeah. the interesting thing, isn't it? Because yes. because companies rarely, I mean, turkeys tend not to vote for Christmas, and and managers tend not to vote for uh, radical change in, in reality. Yeah. but which is yeah, I and I think that for me, one of the hardest things working at Alibaba. I mean, I know companies go through these changes, um, but the the pace of change was so much faster. Like I worked at. Uh, a large U.S. multinational in New York for some time. I worked at consulting firms, and um, but but Alibaba was like another level of just constant re restructuring, um, and part of that had to do with the industry, but also just the company culture um, not being afraid to do that. I mean, that's I think that's really interesting because there's, there's, there's a, there was a whole kind of um, I don't know if they use the word cult, but a kind of movement, particularly in the States. You know, we, they talk about, we talk about great companies, you know, good mm. to great, um, built to last, all those things. Yeah. And yet, I mean, we know from um, Shang Ray Min, who's the, who was until recently CEO of Hire. And I remember him, I clearly remember him saying to us very early on, um, it had to be translated because um, he doesn't speak English, but he yeah. said, when we asked him about great companies, he said, there are no great companies. There are only relevant companies. And it's it, it just a different, you know, a different take, really, because in, in the States and in, in the Western world, we tend to think that greatness is something you can achieve. And once you get there, you know, you, you, you've arrived. And obviously, you know, yeah. go, go back to the 80s and Tom Peters in search of excellence. It was pointed out that a lot of the companies that he put on a pedestal as being the great companies promptly, you know, in the next decade fell off. And that seems to be almost, um, you know, it's the rise and fall. Do you yes. think that's different in, in a way of wet thinking that, that that perhaps I mean obviously we're only talking about two Chinese companies in our yeah in our little bit of um research here but does that does that sort of extend? Yes, I mean, well, I'd say that part of the reason why Alibaba has been able to survive for so long is because it's constantly recreating itself, and again, that's part of this philosophy of of constant change uh, and flux, but also staying true to the path. And so that's where this mission and vision uh, play a very important role in terms of setting direction. But at the same time, this what, what I talk about, Tai Chi management principles or yin yang, is a constant flux of, of, of polarities. Um, and, you know, if, if you ask me, like, what is the essence of Tao um, as it relates to the management principles? One is the path or the way, which we talked about earlier. Uh, but two is this har har harmony that has to be struck between the company uh, internally and externally. So being able to understand how you fit into the larger context. And then three is this unity of contradictions, which is very much a Taoist principle, which in the West, I think they call it dialectics. It's the coexistence of opposites. And um, 
this is really strange for me as a, someone growing up in the States to, to think about how can you have these contradictions coexisting? Because what we often look for is consistency, like just the logic of one way, and you know, it's black and white. And um, Jack is always talking in riddles. Um, I talk about how his first speech in Harvard Business School, he said Alibaba was successful because it had no money, no business plan and no technology. And then everybody's like, this is absurd. You know, um, or, you know, we, we've become the world's largest e-commerce company by pursuing the smallest businesses. Um, and so, you know, but, but if you break this down, this, this ability to kind of embrace both and then adapt yourself based on kind of the situation is, is sort of the essence of that principle of the dialectic or unity of contradictions. Okay. Take that the other way. Do you think that, I mean, cause I think you're right. The, the, the that, that binary thinking, yeah, that is that is a feature of. I mean, I I, I accept that some of it, it applies to Europe as well, but particularly I think in America, do you think that that is a weakness? Do you think that will lead to, you know, perhaps that's the Achilles' heel of of, of American um, society in a way? Perhaps I'm going too far. Okay, um, well, that's a good question, and I think this can extend to a much larger conversation around even like geopolitics, mm. because. Um, what we're facing now is this this confrontation of whether or not you know U.S. and China can coexist in their with their own aspirations, and um, I think that if we bring it back down just to the company, um, I, I I do think that you have to be more flexible in in, in the world today. There are no set paths um, because of the, the the rate of change, particularly now with AI, um, and I think that we will have to adapt our thinking to to this new reality and um also i think the yes, the aspect of hol hol holism or hol being holistic and how we think about it it's no longer just about us and the company and what we want to do but also how that has a greater impact on on the society and um you know other other ramifications and so to me at least the way i see this in writing the book that's that's an asian sort of trait right philosophical trait and when Jack was building Alibaba, he brought in uh, early on, he brought in um, these biologists that talked about ecosystems and what that is. So we could understand how um, our e-commerce marketplaces were actually um, related to the larger sort of society. And I, I found that very interesting and, and also quite inspiring because that's where you get the sense of responsibility where you say, OK, if we have this marketplace, we're employing these people. We're also uh, affecting you know, their livelihoods and um, how does this relate to payments and banks and logistics? And, um, you know, I, I I think that that is also a trait of this, this Eastern thinking. So, you know, the good thing is that places like Silicon Valley are, are quite open-minded. I think they've already integrated many different ways of, of thought in their businesses. But it's really a question of how much do you actually do what you say? I mean, there's a lot of lip service that's also going on out there and people will say, we want to change the world. We want to do this and that, but are you really, do you really truly believe that? I think that's, that's when it really, you know, the rubber hits the road, so to speak. There's a nice comment from David Moore. David says, hello, Brian. Jack Ma described one clear difference between China and America as in American movies, the hero lives. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't watched that many Chinese movies, but uh, <laughs> can you speak? Can, is, is that true? Is that what Jack said? And uh, can you speak more yeah, about this? this but, 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 but David left off the second part of the sentence, which is what happens in the Chinese movies. So um, part of that context was Jack was talking about entertainment and why Hollywood is so successful. And, you know, the hero, the concept of hero is in the West is, is very, you know, there's always a good ending to the Hollywood films. Nobody wants to be the hero in a Chinese film because they end up dying. <laughs> because they, they sacrificed themselves. So um, I don't know if, if David's comment was in relation to to just the context of film and entertainment or <laughs> kind of in the real world. But, um, you know, I, I think um, what, uh, what, what China does need are more um, heroes in terms of uh, trying to impact society and change society for the better. And in some ways, entrepreneurs uh, serve that purpose. Um, and that gets into probably a little bit more um, a complex conversation around what's happening today. But I do think that um, entrepreneurs for the last 40 years 
and 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 let me say, and not only in China but every other society, have been some of the, the greatest heroes in terms of creating change uh, and progress for um, for our communities and society. Okay, I'm going to ask you a slightly unfair question, but obviously you you've you've had this fascinating, I mean, you you remarkable journey because you obviously you 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 get both contexts. But how has that affected and influenced your own leadership style? Do do you reflect on that? I mean, what what did you learn? I do with Mark. Yeah. So I'll tell you one thing I learned is it's a lot easier to analyze and write about a great leader than to try and be one yourself. Um, that's one realization. The second is, I mean, if I if I and I and I loved working with Jack because every day was like uh, a mini uh, MBA course on leadership. Just observing him and seeing him how he you know, how it interacts, how he thinks. I realize that I, I'm an ide- idealist like Jack. Um, you know, I, I, I try uh, and, and give people the benefit of the doubt. I, I, I have a belief that good things are possible. Um, and so, so that's what motivates me. Um, but I also have a, I think, you know, leaders also are very clear in terms of where their weaknesses are. And um, for me, um, I don't think that I have the same level of courage that someone Jack like Jack has. Um, Jack... Uh, had many trials and tribulations in his life, but I think that's what allowed him to become the kind of leader he is who doesn't feel fear of failure and doesn't fear, um, you know, trying to overcome these these barriers. And for me, that's uh, been a challenge and, and, I, and I have recognized that. And then as we talked about, um, charisma um, is, is also something that, that Jack is able to mobilize, you know, th- tens of thousands of people in the stadium. And uh, my best attempt was 30,000 people uh, during a all hands meeting. And I was scared uh, out of my wits uh, at that event. But um, I, I do think that the other thing that is probably most profound is uh, his ability to uh, nurture and um, kind of develop his team. Um, I think a lot of leaders often will end up micromanaging because they feel they know best how to do things. And Jack, I think, has a lot of trust in his people. Um, and also um, empathy uh, in, in understanding them. And so that has been a powerful force in uh, enabling his team to succeed. Because some of these people, I'll tell you, his early founders, um, founding team, were other English teachers. Some of them um, you know, didn't have the backgrounds that you would expect from a global like, you know, multi-billion dollar business, but they grew with the company and Jack, could identify the talent and he can nurture it. And, um, you know, many of them ha- remain in leadership positions today, uh, which I think is a great testament to his ability as a um, leader. Can, can you talk, Brian, about what, what you're doing now and radii.co? Yep. Uh, yes. So thank you for asking. Um, so radii.co is really a passion project. It's a um, digital media platform that's really focused on trying to build understanding between um, East and West uh, using uh, s- stories from, you know, that, that focus on youth culture here in, in uh, China and beyond Chinese youth culture. And the reason uh, it focuses on things like music, arts, entertainment, wellness, uh, digital life. And I, I in a similar vein, um, you know, I felt it was important to try and, uh, bridge understanding uh, between uh, this region and the world, because uh, I think there's a lot of nuance that is lost um, in communicating um, between cultures and countries. And uh, given what we're facing today in terms of the tension, um, business is a great way to build understanding because everyone's working towards a common goal uh, when, when when they partner together. But I think culture is also a great way for people to understand how other groups uh, think and, and, you know, they'll f- come to find often that what, what people love and celebrate are not that different from others across the ocean. Got a couple of people asking about the sort of some of the, some of the tensions, um, you know, between the government and, and Chinese companies. How, how should we in the West interpret um, some of Alibaba's sort of setbacks in recent times? I mean, what, what, what are we actually seeing? What, what was the bigger picture? Yes. So I would frame this as, you know, this is part of a larger trend globally, where I think there is a concern for the influence and power of big tech, um, whether it's US, Europe, 
or China. It's just that the the the, the tools and the the methodology being used to try and moderate or control or manage these big tech is different. Um, and in China, I think there's been quite a strong reaction to certain aspects of uh, tech's expansion. I mean, Alibaba is one company, but there are also other companies like Tencent, Didi, and others that experienced this sort of uh, you know change in in in, in temperament uh, of, of government regulation. I think the industry benefited greatly for the last 20 years from a, what I call a late touch approach to governing tech and that really allowed it to flourish. But I think now what's happening is one, um, the, 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 the power and concentration of tech has gone beyond what I think governments are comfortable with. But two, there's also an effort to divert or redirect investments and resources into new industries that are moving from high growth to what they call as more quality growth industries. Um, that's things like green tech, healthcare, biotech, new materials, semiconductors. So all of that is sort of the context to what I think is happening, not just for Alibaba, but many companies um, in the market. That was interesting. Yeah. You know, it always strikes me that the, the Chinese uh, are more comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. And that's the fundamental difference in, in, in their approach to business. There is that aspect of ambiguity because I think on the one hand, maybe authorities want to have the flexibility. On the other hand, they're not really sure what is the best choice at that moment, but they know something needs to be done. And, um, you know, I think the, the flip side of that is once they do decide, then it's very clear and very directed and very fast. <laughs> we talked about this earlier before we came on the call, the speed of the development of the high speed railway is unprecedented. And you've seen this in so many aspects so of society. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's a pro and con, you know, what I, what I found, and I'm sure you guys would agree is that no, no system is perfect today. And, and it's really about trying to figure out what you can learn from the others that and to make your system better, I think is, should be the approach as opposed to just, you know, being very uh, judgmental about everything from that system. Do you do you think that, that, that China's rise to become the kind of to to really to economic world dominance is inevitable? And and should we, I mean, to overtake America in, in time? And do you and do you think that we should be worried by that? So you know, rather than the word dominance, I would think about. Um, how China's rise can contribute to addressing kind of larger existential issues. Um, and, you know, the question would be really, how can we coexist rather than try and dominate one another? And I think that if you look at the math behind this 1.4 billion people uh, versus America's 330 million people, uh, America today already ha still has on a per capita basis, five times, uh, you know, the size in terms of, uh, per capita income, the population. If China uh, sort of continues to grow economically, it's just a matter of time. It's basic math that it will become the world's largest economy. But at the same time, I think that China's aspiration from what I can see is more about self-sufficiency as opposed to dominance. Um, and I think that in the US, we, we are concerned because we view it as a threat because China, we feel may overturn or change the norms the global global standards and the norms that we're used to living by, and 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 I guess you know rather than be worried about this, it's a question of how do we figure out how to integrate um, this uh, rising power into the system, but also figure out how uh, what we need to do in order to continue to strengthen um, America. Uh, speaking as an American, I mean I, I want to speak for everyone on this call because we're quite diverse, but I think. My personal view is that America should really be focusing as much on strengthening itself, its innovation, its technology. Uh, I think America has a lot of unique traits that differentiate it from China. And if you ask me about how the, the Chinese sentiment is towards America, at least the people that I interact with day in and day out, there's still great respect and admiration for the country. Um, and uh, I think that the admiration and respect come from what makes America so 
unique in terms of its ability to innovate and, and be good at all the things that it has been. And I just feel like um, that's the approach we should be taking as opposed to worrying about it and trying to contain them, but rather lift up ourselves in America to continue to to grow and, and, and develop at a fast enough rate to stay ahead. Mm. Yeah. So as, as he was developing Alibaba, who did Jack Ma look to for inspiration? Did he look to people like Steve Jobs or, or, or other organizations? Which were the organizations and individuals that inspired him? You know, I, that's exactly the question I, I set out to answer when I got asked to be his uh, uh, special assistant and chief of staff. So for years, I was observing. And, you know, um, I hate to tell you, uh, uh, Stuart, but there is no one person. Um, Jack is this guy who would, and I, and I was also curious who's his guru, right? You know, everyone has like this, this advisor or this wise person that they go and talk to. And, and, and Jack, what I noticed is he'll talk to all different kinds of people. And then he, what, what he's a master of is synthesizing views from presidents, from business people, but also, you know, museum curators and, you know, even, you know, taxi drivers that, that we might be interacting with or, um, you know, people like the doorman at the hotel that he talks to. And he gains a comprehensive perspective around what, you know, how people are thinking in that, in that market or, you know, just the sentiment in that country, or even when it comes to different industries, he's um, new industries that he's trying to learn about. He is, is the master of taking that information and, and synthesizing it and then coming up with his own perspective or position. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's how he operates. And, and I was, I was quite uh, impressed that he's able to uh, process information from such diverse sources and then come up with uh, a position of his own. Uh, and that's really interesting too, because that's one of the things we observed with Zhang Weimin at, at Hire as well. Mm. It, he actually, I mean, we've met a lot of CEOs over the years and he is, I think without doubt, the, the, the most widely read in terms <laughs> of, of management thinking and management thinkers, person, yeah. the CEO certainly that we have ever encountered. And you know yeah. he's, he's not he's not even reading in English. He's he's obviously reading translation. But yes, that, that and again it's that's that non-binary um, element whereby you don't just say, well, this guy's good and this this is this is the answer. It, it's just yes. fascinating. And I I don't know whether you know we, again we've got a small su set of of data with with two CEOs that we or or two uh, business leaders yeah. that, we, that we know. Um, but I would wonder if that extends. But it's an interesting it is an interesting um, difference perhaps. Yeah. No, no, that's, I mean, that's a fair observation. And I think, I'm sure you've talked to many great thinkers, but one of the things that really stands out in my mind for Jack is he's, he's definitely a contrarian and he's always challenging assumptions uh, when, when people say things to him. Um, and I think that that's his natural reaction is just to kind of challenge and say, is that really true? And then he'll eventually come to his own decision or, or, or conclusion on it. But um so, you know, to say like, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk, all these, I'm sure he pays attention to them and he's, he's met and talked to them. But at the same time, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw the interview 2019, he was at a conference on a, on a stage with Elon Musk, the two of them were speaking and it was like two ships passing in the night because they're, they're just thinking in such different ways, but they're both such successful people. Um, so clearly Jack didn't fully buy into everything that Elon says. No, probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Brian, uh, we're out of time. Um, if people want to find out about you, more about you and, and your work, where, where can they find it? Uh, so I do have a website for the book. It's brian-wong.com. Very easy. B-R-I-A-N hyphen W-O-N-G.com. And that'll have all the information on, on the book and some of the past uh, articles and, and talks that we've done. And then I have my LinkedIn, uh, which people can find me uh, just typing in my name in Alibaba. Fantastic. Thank you. For, thank you for joining us from Shanghai today, Brian. It was a re really Pleasure. fantastic story. And I think it's such a, ri a rich vein of learning, learning about uh, Chinese managers and hugely successful Chinese entrepreneurs like Jack Ma. 
So we really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone who's joined us from throughout the world. Nice to see somebody from Nairobi in in Kenya joining us uh, and all all the others. Thank you very much. Uh, Next week, we will be joined by Pia Lauritsen talking about curiosity and asking questions. That's on the 12th of April. Brian Wong, thank you very much. Thank you so much.